Good morning, I'm Bill. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bill. No relation. <laughs> you know, the temptation is to uh, come to a situation, a meeting like this, and do something profoundly spiritual. And the most spiritual thing I could think about for the Sunday morning meeting was that the fact that is that we're all here against all odds, and that's true for myself personally. I'm not supposed to be an alcoholic by birthright or any other reason. I mean, I'm not Irish, I'm not Catholic, I got a college education, I had a nice upbringing. I don't really have anything to point to in my life that would indicate I would wind up to be a desperate alcoholic. And in 10 years of drinking, I wound up by the age of 24, locked myself in a house in Canoga Park trying to commit suicide by drinking myself to death. I was up to a half a gallon of vodka a day just to stay even. The magic in the drinking was gone. There was no illusion I could continue to function. I was just waiting to die. I weighed 185 pounds. I had a red face. I couldn't see. I couldn't brush my teeth. I couldn't take a shower for all the reasons that we know so well. And I tried all the logical answers. I couldn't pull myself up by my bootstraps, you know, any longer. <laughs> Religion didn't work. Self-help books didn't work. The shrink didn't work. Nothing I knew worked. And all I knew was, was that I was different and I wasn't ever going to get out of this trap and I may as well just die. And uh, I didn't. And I couldn't have told you at that time, at the age of 24, what was wrong with me. You see, I had all these feelings. Drinking was never the problem. The feelings were the problem. The problem was is that I seemed to be more sensitive than the other people around me. The problem was I didn't seem to fit in. The problem was I was able to see the world in terms of the big picture and the futility of all things in life. The problem was I had high expectations for myself and other people. I had a sponsor named Clint who described that real well. He said, your expectations are up here and you operate around this level here and then we fail and our solution is raise the expectations. And I did that over and over and over again. I couldn't live up to my own standards. And the problem was that it had nothing to do with the fact that I didn't care. The problem was is that I cared too much. And I felt alone and aloof and different from other people. And when I drank, Someone else described it real well. He said, I felt normal. And that's uh, kind of where I was. I was always chasing that little space in time that's about this long where everything's okay, where I deserve my spot on the planet, when I can feel hope for tomorrow and the guilts and remorses leave me and I can feel empathy and love for another human being and, and uh, fantasize that maybe I'll be a, a father and a husband the next day and, and a worker and that. And by the age of 24, I had lost a home and a wife and a child to drinking and a job. And I had it all out on the outside, but I couldn't keep up the appearances anymore. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And the alcohol didn't work anymore. And I was in the trap. And I found myself in a situation where I couldn't get drunk and I couldn't get sober. But there was nothing to do but wait to die. And I don't know what happened exactly except a series of coincidences happened that allowed me to come to Alcoholics Anonymous and with your help change my life. My non-alcoholic brother who's with me today, sitting over here, took me out of that house in Canoga Park and made me go live with him. Then I got a job I shouldn't have gotten. And then I accidentally, coincidentally met a member of this program named Art C who told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went dry for a while, and I didn't want to join up because I didn't want to buy your cockamamie books. And I don't want to give you my money, 25% of my monthly income, like another program down the street, which will go nameless, did. I'll give you a hint. They charge you six grand to reach a state of clear. I don't want to go to your stupid meetings, I'm not a joiner, and what about my social life, which consisted largely of watching television alone? But I didn't have any other answers, and I told that guy, I said, thanks a lot, I'm doing fine on my own. A month later, I called him and surrendered. He had told me about the disease. He said I had a disease of a twofold nature if I was an alcoholic, an allergy to the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. 
And what that meant was is that if I abstained from drinking, the next time I took a drink, it would set off a craving, a mental and physical craving for another one, and I might not be able to control my behavior if I started drinking again. He said the disease was progressive and that it got worse whether I drank or not. And in Christmas time, 1973, I thought I'd try what he said. I had one drink. The next thing I knew, it was Tuesday morning. I'd lost three days out of my life. I called him and surrendered. He asked me to meet him for dinner that night at a restaurant in Westwood. And my life hasn't been the same since. If you're brand new to us, one thing I knew for certain when I came in was that nobody understood me. And that night in the restaurant, he starts a process that's known around AA as reading your mail. He starts asking me these questions like, well, Bill, you ever felt lonely in a crowd of people? Yeah, how'd you know? Well, you ever feel lonely at your own family dinner table? Yeah, how'd you know? You ever ask your folks if you were adopted? (laughs) Yeah, how'd you know? You ever felt guilty and not known what it was you were guilty of? Yeah, how'd you know? Ever had feelings of impending doom, Bill? (laughs) Yeah, how'd you know? You ever try to stop at drink number six, number five, sort of slide right by night after night? Yeah, how'd you know? Bet you're in a lot of financial trouble, aren't you, Bill? Yeah, how'd you know? (laughs) The guy demonstrated that he knew me from the inside out, and it was a different approach than I'd heard before. I went to my first meeting. I heard a guy named Cliff R. from Oceanside, I later found out, was the main speaker. Turned out he was familiar with car sleeping and loaded shotguns in your mouth and wife troubles and all those things. And I couldn't believe he was telling those stories in public. They corralled me after the meeting. I couldn't remember the words of the Lord's Prayer. They said, how'd you like the meeting, Bill? I said, I'd like it just right. I fit in there. I found a place. I'm one of those. I haven't had a drink since. That's 13 years and 10 months. I bought the big book on credit that night, took it home, and took all the steps. It said, <laughs> but I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk to the guys with one day, because here's what I knew. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, because of my track record, that I could not stay around here very long. You see, I'm a failure in every department. I have no consistency, no willpower, no backbone, no moral spine. I never finished anything I ever started. And I knew I'd have to fail out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I gave myself 90 days or so. I thought I'd soak as much in as I could, and then I'd take what I learned out on the streets. And it hasn't been necessary to hit the streets again that way, largely through the guidance and love of you people. And uh, I was really lucky in that I was able to surrender my judgment a couple of times, and that's allowed me to stay here. See, my way got me to that house in Canoga Park, nearly dead. I smelled death on myself. I knew it was coming. And uh, I haven't had to do that anymore. I haven't had to wake up with the shakes, the fears, or the knowledge that they're coming to get me. I don't sleep with a loaded gun under my pillow anymore. None of that. I work. I'm a productive member of society today. My relationships have been restored to those people who left me. And I can't tell you exactly how I got from there to here, except that I did take the time and trouble to ask how you work this program and try it to the best of my ability, even though I knew it would be imperfect and even though I knew I would fail. And it hasn't been necessary to fail. And it's not necessary for you to fail either if you're brand new and you got one day. This has been the greatest trip I ever knew. And I'll tell you the secret and sit down and make way for our, our main speaker. All the psychologists and the self-help books and everything told me that if I just arranged my attitude that my life would fall into shape. And I used to spend a lot of time on the bar stools drinking vodka and tonic trying to arrange my attitude. (laughs) The only trouble is I couldn't keep it up. My attitude would evaporate over and over again in about 20 seconds. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and they say, we don't care about your motives. I said, this isn't a moral issue. What we want you to do is change your actions. You change your actions, your feelings, and your life will follow along, and that's worked for me ever since. And if you're brand new to Alcoholics Anonymous, all you gotta do is turn to somebody next to you, grab on and say, how do I do this thing? And see if they'll be your sponsor and follow their direction, and you'll have a a much, much different life than you'd ever expected. 
I can't go into all the benefits that I've had since I've uh, become sober, but probably the biggest one is I've come to know who I am and what I am and found out I'm a good person after all and found out that there is love and that it's worth staying around and that I don't need to die. And uh, I hope you stay around long enough so it'll happen to you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Our next 10-minute speaker from Manhattan Beach is Chuck. Hi, I'm Dorothy. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Dorothy. I'm glad to be here today. I'm Dorothy from Kansas, really. I was born and raised in Kansas. <laughs> And it was a mistake. I knew I didn't belong there. I'm the one that had to deal with the tornadoes. I had a normal childhood uh, up until about the time that my father died when I was 12. And then I realized that I was in a dysfunctioning household. My mother was on prescription drugs, and things got a little whiffy after that. Uh, through high school, I, I got another dad right away, and through high school, um, I worked on the farm quite a bit. And that was a good experience. I look back to that time and I think about how great it was. It was a time in my life that I enjoyed. And my dad liked my work. I got A plus in farming. The only thing is, is he could never explain to me what I'm supposed to do with my grease gun. I had a little Ford tractor with overdrive and a grease gun. And he says, oh, heck, just grease anything that moves. Fortunately, we had a lot of grease. After uh, high school, I never drank through that time in my life. I went to uh, several cities and um, tried to learn to be a sophisticated person. And I thought that entailed drinking and smoking. Well, it didn't work. I threw it up. I mean, I just couldn't hold it. I couldn't go out on a date and have a drink. It wouldn't last. And, and they'd never call back because I made such a mess of myself. But you know how we are. Through perseverance, in a year I turned pro and I was drinking in a grown man under the table. And uh, I, I prided myself on that, being able to hold my booze. At that point I was uh, working for a major card company in Kansas City, painting and... Um, got married, moved to California, was married for 10 years, um, got into retailing and got rid of that husband. It was boring. I didn't know that, you know, I was the boring one. And uh, worked my way up into a buyer's position. And there I met my soulmate, my dress manufacturer alcoholic that was to be the excitement in my life. And we had a good time. We had, um, actually I had no idea what alcoholism was about until I met him. I used it uh, before that, but not to this extent. And after I was married for a while, I decided to try it his way. I was tired of being the responsible one, and I thought, gee, he never worries about anything. <clears throat> and so, uh, that's the, that's, the, that's the road that I chose for myself. And uh, we had a good time. We got married after we dated for about three and a half years. And uh, we had a fishing boat that uh, we took out every weekend. And we played, all, we played all night and fished all day. And life was really good. Uh, it was just a little confusing at times. I, I can recall one time... It was always in my mind that if you're going to drink, you should have a proper glass. They didn't teach me that in Kansas. It was dry. I just learned that in the movies. That if you're going to drink, you ought to pour it into the right glass. Well, he didn't. He just drank his right out of the bottle. And I thought that was really gross. One day uh, we were, well, one day, a lot of days, we'd go down to our garage and we'd be sitting there in our big shiny car waiting to go someplace and uh, he'd say wait a minute I forgot something now you know I'm 
I'm an alcoholic. I know what's going on. He was up there drinking straight out of the bottle. He went back down there and I said, wait, I forgot something. <laughs> so, you know, I drank it straight out of the bottle. Get back in the car. He said, I forgot something. Wait a minute. He went up. He got back. I forgot something. I went up. I got back. We forgot where we were going. Uh, they should have given tickets on boats then. We needed a few. It's, um, I never knew where I was going to go when I got on the boat. And uh, I always thought that I was flexible. That's what I called it. I'm ready to go anywhere, anytime, get on that boat. I didn't know whether we were going to end up in Mexico or San Francisco, but I thought that was being flexible. It was drunk. That's what it was. <laughs> We did this for a while and um, had a lot of drinking scenes. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything here today that you haven't heard. We had uh, a typical alcoholic marriage. I had one day where I had a moment of clarity and I was standing in the kitchen with my glass of vodka and I was thinking it doesn't work. There's something wrong here. By then I was drinking about Oh, I, I guess about a fifth of vodka a day, and that was just to warm up for cocktail hour in the afternoon. Um, during which time I often thought, you know, I started marking the bottle because I knew that uh, by three o'clock in the afternoon they were playing tricks on me. That someone had been in there, but it wasn't me that was drinking all that. And no one was there, so I started putting water in the bottle to make sure that he didn't know how much I was drinking. He didn't know he was drinking Boilermakers on the way home from work. I know, you know, if we had a problem, we'd run across the street and buy a case. There really wasn't a problem running out of food. But I started doing these little whippy things that made me think that perhaps all wasn't normal on this front. So that morning I stood there with my moment of clarity and I was thinking, I've got what I've always wanted. I have a man that loves me and that I love. I've got this beautiful home and material things. These are things that I've always thought that I wanted, but it didn't work. I called a counselor. I said what I couldn't believe that I was saying. I think I have a little drinking problem. And she, she was surprised, and uh, she suggested that I go to the Pacific Group. And we both came in to the Pacific Group for our first meeting. It was up at the synagogue, and we had no idea if we were in the right place. I thought that it must have been a bar mitzvah. There couldn't have been that many sober alcoholics in the world. We walked in, and there's Keith Seats. Hi! You know, like that, pumping our hand, and I thought, this is it. We're home. We're with a whole lot of drunks, just like us. We felt at home just right from the beginning, and I thought, we're going to be saved because in that moment of clarity I thought that one of us was going to die because of alcoholism. I knew that we couldn't go on that way. Not long after that time, uh, we had been in about six months, he was discovered to have had lung cancer and he knew that the clock was running out. And I was devastated. I didn't know how to live with stuff like this, and especially without booze. I don't know how to do this. And somehow, this group carried us. Chuck and Susie were there. And they just carried us through that. And I, I, to this day, I think I know how the program works, but I knew for sure how it worked then. I'm really confused now how it really works. All I know is that I'm sober today, so it must work me when I don't know how to work it. He died before his first birthday, and he died a sober death. And somehow I got through that with your help. I know that God works through people. I met another man. After that, we got married, and uh, very, very soon after that, and... Uh, Stayed in the program, moved to the South Bay, and there's AA there. And things are going good. And 
all of a sudden one weekend this is um this is my story and it it does come back into aa i have to tell you about me and what's going on with me today i had a congestive heart failure and i blew up over the weekend uh, 30 40 pounds i didn't know what was happening i went to the doctor and uh, they finally said that uh, i had a couple of heart valves that wasn't working and oh this was two years ago and i go uh, you know the velcro to my hand and my forehead oh god you know this is really dramatic stuff and i i've had it i'm a goner and i said i need a drink and my husband that's not on the program said you need a meeting <laughs> then he got me to a meeting and um I related to one of my friends in AA that uh, that was one of the only times that I really wanted a drink, except for I have a fear of flying. I say this fear if I'm on an airplane and on the way down, I want to have a drink. And she said, are you kidding me? Do you think they're going to serve you when they're on the way down? They're going to be looking at their own panties. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, that's probably right. So, um, anyhow, we got on with this uh, heart diagnosis, and um, it turned out to be worse than what I thought. The news kept getting worse, and uh, it, they discovered that I had cancer, and that was really what was making my heart go bad. And so I um, found out that no one in L.A. treated it, and the specialist that was going to look after me happened to be at Mayo's back in Rochester, Minnesota. So we started going back there on regular trips. They did a massive surgery. They thought they could get it, and they couldn't. Um, so I went through nine months of chemo. I lost my hair one weekend. It just went floating off into the air. I watched it go. It came back. And um, I still have the tumor, and I still have the heart problem. But my last check was that the tumor's smaller. And the oncologist at the head of Mayo's there looked at me, couldn't understand it because after nine months of chemo, I've been off of any treatment now for a year. The tumor's smaller. And he looked at me and said he couldn't understand it and he tried to explain it. And he said, I really don't understand this. And he said, you must have a guardian angel sitting on your shoulder. And I said, I do. And I know that I do. I've asked for your help and your prayers and I've received it. And I know that I have, and I felt it. And today, I'm okay. That's what it's all about. It's today, and I have a choice today of what my life's going to be. And through this program, through you, mine, and your higher power, today it's okay. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. When I used to drink in Syracuse, New York, the policemen used to call me a mad Indian. Now that I'm sober in AA, people call me John the Indian. I like that one much better. I'd like to uh, congratulate the four young people who are celebrating the first day of sobriety, also the young man who's been sober since 1947. <laughs> I, uh, I guess my miracle started to happen one night. I was in a, a mission in uh, Syracuse, New York, and I have been living in missions and Salvation Armies for seven years that I lived in Skid Row. Uh, a man came to see me one night in a mission. He says to me that he's a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, good for you. He says, I came here to bring you to a meeting. I said, I don't want to go to a meeting. The only meetings I have gone to in those seven years, a fellow by the name of Tom will run the rescue mission if you, uh, 
If you attend these religious services, he would allow you to sleep in a dormitory without a bum. So I have attended many of Tom's religious services. But tonight I had bed. And I had no wish to go to another meeting. The fellow says to me, John, but they have coffee and donuts and they're free. Well, I said, why didn't you say so in the first place? And you know, you will look back, as I'm sure, when we watch those four young people coming up here. We all arrived here for the first time. I was 28 years old then. I couldn't read and write. Never been married. Never had a driving license. Never owned a car. I've more or less been living in the streets for seven years and can you imagine if someone came to me that night and said, John, you just hang in there. And one day, Hank from Los Angeles, California, will call you and say, John, could you be our Sunday morning spiritual speaker or whatever the hell you call it? In this beautiful convention center, of course, nobody will ever believe that, huh? I certainly wouldn't. I especially wouldn't have never believed if someone said that, you know, I still don't have uh, an education and I still don't talk good English and uh, I'm still an Indian. And among you, I am sure, as many people as we have here, you might have some lawyers and some doctors and Indians and the joke. Somebody told me when you tell the joke in California, you have to remind them. <laughs> and can you imagine me standing up here and, and, and in my heart, the only thing I can find is say, I am grateful. So when we talk about miracles, I suppose we're talking about someone has changed to a point where Instead of being ashamed of who he is, instead of uh, feeling unworthy, instead of worrying that somebody will say, well, you don't even talk with English. Something happened to tell me, John, you should be grateful. And I suppose coming to these meetings, you learn so many things. I am a fortunate person. I, I've always loved AA. I still go to five and six meetings a week. I have always gone to five, six meetings every week. I have met all kinds of people in over 30 years that I have been sober. I have been going to step meetings for better than 25 years or twice a week. And I have made friends like Father Fred, who is a dear friend of mine. Sitting there in those step meetings and listening and learning things like, John, learn to understand. Try to understand. Someone will talk about acceptance like Clancy this morning. John, try to accept. Learn to accept. And someone will talk about God, about praying. And you know, when you listen all this time, one day, you stand up here and you look back with entirely a new attitude. And you see things that you would have never seen. And you understand things that you will never understood. And when I look back in my own life, the very first thing that I can see with my training in AA is that I am a very lucky human being. And I have much to be grateful for. There have been some special people in my life, it seems, that God put there. Times when I needed help, somebody seems to be there. And the first man I met, of all people, was a man who stood at the door in that central group in Syracuse, New York, who was a lawyer, so over 13 years. 
And every Friday night he would stand there and he would shake hands to those who were coming to a meeting. And after the meeting he would stand there and he would shake hands to those who were leaving. And as I was walking through the doors of AA, and you know I was dirty, I have been sober three weeks, but I still have wine stories because I needed to be sober six weeks before my face would really clear up. He stood there and he grabbed my hand like he did to anybody else and he said that he was glad to see me. And I wasn't glad to see him at all. I sat down and my first speaker in AA was a lady judge. And I was confused from the time she opened her mouth. The very first thing she said, if you are new, try to identify. <laughs> you can imagine here I am, I'm 28 years old, and sitting there with wine sores and long hair, dirty, I couldn't read and write, and I'm in a mission. You can imagine me sitting there saying to myself, you know, her and I have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> she, she used words that took me years to understand them. Uh, the chairman mentioned them this morning. She got to open her talk by saying, it's the mental obsession that precedes the first drink, and once you take a drink, now it's coupled with a physical compulsion. <laughs> I used to say, holy Christ. You know. I was glad I was there. I thought I had something very special. But I said to myself, as soon as I get my donuts, <laughs> I'm getting the hell out of here. You know, I certainly didn't belong there, that's for sure. She talked about her father being a judge and her husband is a director in General Hospital. But there was that one man stood there, and I guess miracles never happen unless you meet those who believe in a power greater than himself man stood there who had never seen me before, but he understood me. I've learned that, you know, in through the years that I have been sober. You know, in our 11th steps, there is a prayer of St. Francis, and among other things he said, Lord, I pray that I may understand rather than to be understood. He must have said to himself, you know, this guy, he feels uncomfortable here. Look at him, he's dirty, needs a haircut, has wine sores. He knew I didn't fail, I belonged here. You probably know, as I know today, when I see a new person, that I needed help. Because he was a man that put his arms around me when I was leaving, and he says to me, before you leave, uh, what about meeting some of my friends? And that's perhaps what touched me. People in AA seems to be, they seems to wanted me to come back. They, they really cared. And I guess, I guess I often think that when our co-founder put a program together, he knew but there was an Indian somewhere who couldn't read and write. He's lost. He can't even afford to buy his own room. He has no trade. He's lonely. He's scared. He feels that he's different. I'm going to set up this program so when he walks in one day, you will meet people that he will accept them. You will meet people that it will understand him. And above all, he really will meet people who care about him. You see, because that is what touched me. Something the words could not describe the nature of my sickness. It was something there that made me feel, John, those people really care. Go back. And I suppose, you know, 
Where do you go? When you come to that point in life where there is no place to go. I came here, I came back, and of course I needed to come back. I needed to learn those things that it teaches us, like uh, John. It's the first drink. Somehow it makes sense because I have already, I've always known that once I take a drink, I could never stop. But I never connected the, the thing that he talked about, that uh, sorry, Bill uh, talked about this morning, and the lady judge talked about once you take a drink, you see something happens inside and you cannot stop. And it makes sense to me. The other thing I believe when I look back, it really helped me that there were people here who have been sober a long time. And you know, I've been trying to stop drinking for a couple of years, and every time I stop, I walk alone. I never had a moral support. I never had anyone that I could talk to. I never knew of anyone who was trying to do the same thing I was doing, but now, here I was. And then, of course, I met another important person in my life, and that was my sponsor, Pat. Pat. Uh, I never liked. <laughs> I knew Pat. I met Pat in Skid Row. He was an Irishman from an island with a degree. And there is nothing worse than a bum with a degree. <laughs> Pat. Pat knew everything. I walked into a central group one night, Pat comes over to me, he said, John, I I'm your sponsor. I never even asked. I have a car outside, he says, I will bring you home and I will pick you. And Pat was picking me every night from the mission. Sometimes he would bring me a sandwich and we go to meetings and, and I met other people followed by the name of Ari J, who is a secretary in Central Group, was a man who first time invited me to his home on Sunday. He had two daughters, his wife Ellen. I learned later that he inherited a home from his parents who must have been very wealthy. They had a nice pool and a couple of nice cars. Ari was an officer in the bank. And I suppose, as I look back now, Harry wanted me to, uh, wanted to help me in his own way. So I would have a couple of Sundays, I would have a dinner in his house, but I've heard Harry spoke one night. I don't know why I've heard Harry, but and he talked about, he talked about things that we have talked about this weekend and this morning, about how you feel inside. He talks about being afraid. He talks about being lonely. He talks about feeling that he never belonged. And, he, and somehow it shocked me because I, I, I seem to believe that only an Indian who sleeps in a dormitory with bums who cannot read and write, who doesn't have a home or a job and money, I thought he's the only one feel that way. I never knew that a man like Harry, who could live in a, such a big house and, and have money and a job, feels the same way as I do, and I'm sleeping on a dormitory with 40 bums, you know. It was the first time, I think, when I started to learn something about me and about my sickness, but do you know I have always felt that way. This morning we listened to two speakers. They both said that they have come from a good home. I myself cannot say that I come from a good home, but I will say that I have never been an abused person. I have never been abused. My father sang in a small church in a reservation where I came from, and Sunday morning he would stand there 
and he would hold the railing in one hand because he needed to and he had a book on another hand that he never opened and sweat would run on his face I still remember the picture and he would sing and he would sing for a long time until they got rid of him and then he died after he died we the family took sick we lost uh, eight members in my family in five years they all died with TB my I had lost twin brothers in one year when I was 13 my mother was dying with TB and I was scared this is when Harry brought me back when I lived in reservation I've always known fear I was afraid that uh, I was dying I thought even that my people looked upon me as I was like other people in my family I remember asking my mother early one morning I was 13 years old then I was sleeping with her if I was going to die too and my mother said no you're you're strong I'm very proud of you and you're different and she should have never said that but uh, I knew my mother when my mother died that early in the morning about 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock she asked me to get this man who sang in the church the man who replaced my father because my mother wanted to this man to sing the hymn that my father used to sing and that's how she died now I'm telling you something uh, here I am I'm facing a woman like my mother I was very proud that she could die that way because I knew it was honorable but I was scared for mine and I think the, the amazing thing about recovery when we talk about I must have been 35 years old when I was able to share some of the things that I felt sleeping with my mother and looking back in my life the years that I traveled with those drunks in, in Skid Row never once that I have met anyone who said John this morning uh, I'm lonely <laughs> this morning I'm afraid I'm scared this morning I I feel empty none of us I guess thought that we could talk about these things and I never could I remember after my mother died I lived in an old empty house with a dog for almost a year and I couldn't sleep because that's the way fear affects me and I couldn't sleep I get nervous you know and, 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 I, and I couldn't sleep and I have never told anyone never told anyone so I left home when I was 14 my people worked in lumber camps in Maine I went to Maine and I arrived in this little town I wanted to go to lumber camp and work but I was only 14 and the fellow said we don't have hire such a younger people but he said the CC camp it's uh, 20 some miles in the woods and uh, we need a dishwasher if you want to walk that far it's up to you and I went there and I got a job because the army second world war was ready to start and they took all the younger people so I was in lumber camp for four years washing dishes when I was 18 I left I wanted to go back home to my people but I wanted to go back as a soldier so I went to Quebec City and joined the Canadian infantry because I would be closer to home if I should get a pass I was 18 years old and I wanted to see my people seeing me that I'm grown up 
What I didn't know was that in the Canadian Army, if you cannot read and write, they don't allow you to go on training. So I spent three years and a half washing damn dishes. And, and I never went home because, well, washing dishes told me that I wasn't as good as the next person. And that seems to be the problem long time in my life. It became another obsession. You know, I, I wouldn't go out with girls because, not because that I wasn't old enough. You know, I'm sick, not stupid. But I didn't want anybody to know about me. I chum around with the guy who is exactly like me. You know, we neither one of us smoked, neither one of us drank, and we always talk about one day we do great things. <laughs> we never did anything. He wanted to be a farmer. I often wonder what happened to him. Somebody one day told us that in St. Lawrence Street in Montreal, if you have enough money, you can go over there and pick any girl you want. We've been talking about that about six months. One day we all get dressed up and we went over there because we had a lot of money we never drank and we found them. Sure enough, there were girls standing there, about half a dozen of them. You can pick anyone you want. So we stood there. And we stood there. And we stood much longer than most girls did. You know. No spiritual experience that night. I didn't know I needed a drink. You know, we got our discharge together and uh, he says to me, John, what do you say we... We each buy a suit and we'll go and have a few drinks, and we did. We bought a suit, got dressed up, and we went to a brewery cafe in Montreal in the third floor, and as you walk in, there's a three or four piece orchestra playing, and right in front there is a girl singing practically with no clothes on. And I guess that's when I received my first spiritual awakening, you know, and then I took a drink. And of course, drink gives me the same experience, I guess, that it gives to any alcoholic, because that's the way it affected me. Clancy this morning was talking about how you take a drink and, and it seems to numb all the feelings you have about your own reality, the feeling that you're not good enough, the feeling of being scared feeling that somebody might find out that you're an Indian, somebody might find out you don't talk good English, somebody might find out you don't have an education. You know, these things that seems to be there all the time when you're sober and that seems to block everything. There seems to be no way out, you know. And a couple of drinks and it seems to take them away. And I don't know whether it was that I liked so much or whether it was that when I took a drink, an alcohol brought me to another world that I even loved more. A world where I can actually be crazy and say, it's okay, John. You know, I heard speaker one time and he said he didn't like to drink because alcohol brings him to places of things. I drink for that reason. And when I drank, I can be crazy. I can just relax. And the problem with me when I get sober, I get so intelligent, I feel lonely sometimes. <laughs> I can relax and enjoy some of my insanity. I got control at all time. And being doing it for years, I'm very good at it. You wouldn't even know that I'm crazy inside. <laughs> you see me, you said, boy, is he put together. I loved, I loved where I was in a matter of half an hour. I, I liked the music, I liked the girls, I liked the dancing, I liked the people. Another thing that happened in my life, I find myself enjoying falling in love about twice a month. <laughs> I'll be in a bar room drinking with this girl, you know, I'm so drunk I can hardly see her, but she's beautiful. You see, the thing is, you don't realize alcohol affects your vision. Uh, until the next morning when you look at it and say, holy Christ. 
You can't wait to get drunk to fall in love all over again. That's, I enjoy my craziness. I enjoy fight. Some people fight. I used to love them in those days. That's why policemen in Syracuse, New York, used to call me a mad Indian. Well, I just get the feeling sometimes when I'm drinking. I get this feeling sometimes that I can lick anybody. And, and I'll be in a bar room and I look around and I'll find someone that it looks like I don't like. And I would stare at him. And I would stare at him. And if he didn't stare back, I'll go there. And I said, look, you know, I don't like you. <laughs> he says, I don't want any trouble. I said, it's too bad. And I would hit him. And of course, they call a cop. Somebody used to say, John, cops are coming. You better get out of here. But I never do because this guy only opens the door. The cops really, they're going to find out just who they're dealing with. You know, so I wait for them. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. It was funny. I remember the time I was in jail and this guy brought his pants with him because I tore his pants. Now, I didn't know Judge Dorsey was an, an alcoholic. He says to me, John, now he calls me John. Because I've been there like 43 times. He told me that one time. <laughs> What's the problem, John? Well, I said, no problem. I, all I want to do is put him down, but he's so fat. When I said that, Judge Dorsey started laughing. And so the people in the court start laughing too, so I laughed. What the hell? Until he gave me three months. And when I left there, they were still laughing. But those were the fun days because I was still a social drinker. I, 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 haven't, I haven't gotten into troubles that we call troubles. Everybody has different troubles. Trouble with me with alcohol is that when he didn't do anything anymore. He didn't do anything anymore. No more uh, fighting, no more falling in love, you know, no more feeling that you belong there. He just took all those things away and I became, of course, what we know in AA is I became addicted to alcohol. And addiction does one thing, and that is to kill you. It's not there to help you feel good. Yeah. It's there to kill you. It's, it's, it's an enemy. And of course, I don't know that. And the thing about it is that in those days, you know, there were no treatment centers. And the, the, the bunk used to say, John, you look sick. Why don't you take a pledge? So I would go to priest and being, I'm supposed to be a Catholic, and I don't know what Catholic is, but I'm supposed to be one. The priest would say, John, would you like to go to confession? Now, when you're sick, you do anything. But you know what confession means to me? It means that, John, there's something bad about you. You see? You see, the reason the way you live is because there's something bad about you, and if you, if you try to be good, maybe you wouldn't live like that. And my idea of being good is uh, uh, you never criticize no one, you don't punch someone in the mouth, and you go to church every Sunday, and you don't go to bed with women. Now, you try that for a while. Christ has enough to drive you to drink. And he did. Then I go to a mission, and Tom says to me, John, there's a fellow by the name of Billy Graham coming in this city. This man helps a lot of people. You go and see him. So I went to listen to Billy Graham for two weeks in War Memorial in Syracuse, and I was sober. But he laughed. I got drunk, and the judge gave me three months already there. I was in the mission one night when a fellow got up and he said that for years he was a bum just like us. He talks about 75 of us sitting there until one night he said I accepted Christ as my personal savior. Since then he said I got married and I have a job working at night. I bought a, a new station wagon he said 
And then he says, any of you bumps can do the same thing. All you have to do is move forward. Well, I've always wanted a station wagon. And, you know, I didn't care about working nights or day, but I moved forward. I knew nothing about Christ. You know, I've been in lumber camp for four years, and I used to listen to lumberjacks talking about him. And by the time they finished with him, you wouldn't believe him either. <laughs> but I kneeled down, and this guy said I was saved, and next morning I'm facing a judge. He said that to pay at park in the city, it's for the decent people. But somebody someday put the program together, and he seems to think that I needed to be accepted. It seems to think that I needed to be loved, not told how bad I am, that I'm not good enough because I'm an Indian, couldn't read and write, and, and don't have an education, and where I come from. Somebody wants to sit down, and he says, I will put people right in there for you, and you walk in there, and they're going to accept you, they're going to understand you, they're going to love you. By God, he says, you'll feel it. There is a difference between Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's why AA works. It is different, you see. And that's what I felt. That is exactly what I felt. And that's what brought me back. And that's where I met my sponsor, Pat. Pat used to say, John, you can't stay sober and live with those bums. Now, I'm 28 years old, and I never had my own apartment. I felt secure in a mission. I didn't want to leave. But God was on his side because one night mission burned down. And my sponsor said that was the grace of God. Next morning he got me a job working in a step house. It paid me seven dollars and a half a week and I could sleep there. And my job was to wash floors, answer the telephone, make coffee and wash dishes. I get thrown out of there because I, uh, these people, AA people, used to come there every night and they play cards all night. And one night a lady called and she was drunk and she wanted help. And in those days, in my days, you didn't have no treatment center. What you did, you pick them up and bring them home. That's what they used to do. You don't do it now. Things we modernize this bit. <laughs> I got even insurance pays these days. Like perhaps they should. But I couldn't get anyone to pick up this woman. And I knew I was right, but I don't know what to do. When I'm right and nothing happened, I feel trapped. So I do what I always do. I upset the table. And I punch this guy right in the mouth. Never liked the bastard anyway. He had a big mouth. I mean, I could start my own group. Instead, they'd throw me out. And two, three o'clock in the morning, somebody called my sponsor, Pat. He arrived, he picked me up, and he brought me home. And next morning, he brought me back to Major Harvey. I'd been Major Harvey many times. But I was broke. I had no job. And I was with Major Harvey for three years and a half. I went to meetings almost every night in those days. And I was sober. But I, nothing changed in my life. Nothing changed. You know, in Syracuse, New York, every meeting they read a fifth chapter like you do here. I knew there was a program of recovery, but I couldn't read and write. They had no step meetings in those days. And, and, and uh, so one day, in my fifth year sobriety, I left the Salvation Army. And I start walking because I felt lonely inside. I felt that I've heard everything in AA. My God, I've been listening for five years. I know all the stories. I felt scared. I thought maybe somewhere if I just go, I'll find something. And I arrived in Marlboro, Mass. one night at 1.30 in the morning. 
and uh, in, a, in the main street there is a flop house hotel. I went in there and I slept in the men's room. And yet Marlboro has changed my life. It's changed my life. Another person I met was Paul. He owned the restaurant. He said, John, they're starting a new group in Worcester Monday. Would you like to go? I said, sure. I walk into my first step meeting in Worcester in my fifth year sobriety, and there they would read the pages of the steps. The first time I've heard what our co-founder talks about. These are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. And don't you know, it didn't, I didn't like them at all. I didn't understand them. I didn't like some of the things they talk about, particularly the one that said that I should be restored to sanity. You know? Now, I've been around long enough to know that some, I felt some people should be restored. <laughs> Certainly, I was not one of them. But the miracle that we talk about today, the miracle that happens in the program, uh, I met in that discussion meeting my dear friend today, Father Fred. Father Fred was active on institutions. He says to me, John, would you like to come with me to an institution? I said, sure. So he would buy three dozen donuts and we go to institutions and twice a week and we would put, he would put the meetings on and we used to go to Walpole Prison, which is the maximum prison at noontime on Saturday. My God, we had about 200 uh, criminals sitting there and of course, Father Fred likes to talk and he makes sense. We were over there one day when he says, I brought a speaker with me. You know. Now, you know, I'm sick, not stupid. I know it was me. But I wasn't about ready to tell those people about my, my little bits I had in the Jimmyville. These are criminals. But I stood up and I said something. And I sat down and on our way home, Father Fred shook my hand. And he said, that was the best talk he ever heard. <laughs> he told lies. No, he told lies. But Father Fred and I became friendly. I became friendly a man not only who was interested in AA, but who understood. You know? And I would ask questions that you ask when you learn to trust someone. Like... Uh, what do you mean that I need to be restored to sanity? Father Fred said, John, there is something that you don't understand. He said, the step says, come to believe that you could be restored. And all I could think about was back to Billy Graham. All I could think about is back to that priest again. You can't make love to women. You go to church every morning. You can't criticize anyone. Who the hell wants to live like that? You know? Back to this guy who has a work nights and who is a born-again Christian. So I said to Father Fred, how do you believe? <laughs> he said, John, really, he says, it's nothing but being teachable. You know? He said, you know, you don't like a meeting and you walk out. It's not being teachable. It's againsting the program that's going to teach you. It's fighting a program. It's not believing a program. He says, you know, John, it comes just the way it comes. You know? I understood that. Something else he told me that changed my entire life. It's amazing. One night he says to me, John, you know, you have to start from where you are, from who you are and what you have. Clancy was saying that this morning. And on my way home on the bus, used to be $16 from Worcester to Marlboro. First time in my life, I was 33 years old. Thought comes to my mind, John, you're 33 years old and you have no education. You don't have a trade. 
never had a girl, never owned a car, you don't have a job, you don't have money, and they want you to start here. But you see, the thing was, it's not where I was, it's that AA taught me to understand. Like Bill Wilson said, you can't build a house unless you know the prince. See? And on my way home that night, believe me or not, I said, I'm going to try. And it's not by accident when Kathy and I left home. Friday morning, we left a 14-room house. <laughs> a two cars and a truck, six children, a cat and a dog. We know we live like a white man, dollar down. And, uh. <laughs> but what happened? What is the message? That's the thing. What is the message? You see, it is all here. But the thing is, one must come here to get message. And if I can share anything to you in my 30 years, life is every day. It never stops because you know so much. Life is every day. You know, and every day it's for me to come to a meeting. You know. So what happened? Believe me, what is a success in my life? Because I opened the door and I recognized things that happened. Paul says to me from the very first morning, I went to his restaurant. He said, John, Rita, who is a waitress, wants you to paint her house. Could you go and give an estimate? <laughs> Never done it before. <laughs> I went over there. I walked around three times. I went in there and I said, it'll cost you $300. She said, you got a job, because other contractors wanted twelve to fourteen hundred dollars. <laughs> Starting where you have or what you have, it doesn't mean you're going to make sense. I said to Paul, I got a job, but I don't have money. He said, go back and ask Rita. She gave me a hundred dollars, and the very first thing I did is to get a room, cost me seven dollars a week with a little kitchenette. And then I bought me a white coverall. I figured if I'm going to be a president in my own company, I should buy a white coverall. <laughs> I was at the meeting and someone came to see me and he said, John, I'm told you want a ladder. I said, yeah. He said, I work in a telephone company. I will deliver you one Monday morning, a yellow one. <laughs> he said, don't tell anyone it's against the rules, the big yellow ladder. I finished painting a house, I owed Paul $65, because I went in a hole. I went to a meeting and I met a plumber in AA, he said, John, I'm told you're painting houses. I said, I do. <laughs> he says, I have a ranch house seven miles from here, all you need is a seven and a ten foot step ladder. So I borrowed a step ladder and I stood in the corner and I stopped the bus. <laughs> this guy, you couldn't believe. He said, you can't be serious. I said, I am. I'm self-employed. And he says to me, if I give you a ride, would you promise you'll never do it again? My next house was a school teacher. She taught school 40 years and retired. Paul says to me, John, it's only 69 questions. You ask her. You see... One day, because she told me half a dozen times about her school teaching, I said to her one day, you think you could help me to memorize the 69 questions? Uh, I want my driving license. She said, I have taught thousands of people. And a couple of months later, I knew the questions inside her. I went to Marlboro in the police station, and the, the fellow brought me in a little room, and he only asked me two questions. I mean, I was insulted. I was depressed. <laughs> you know, I said to myself, what the hell's the use to spend two months learning anything when nobody gives a damn? <laughs> but here I am in my 50 year sobriety, a president in my own company, and I have a driving license, and Paul came to see me 
with a big black station wagon. I used to call it 11 passengers because I used to bring 11 people to a meeting. He said, John, for $750, it's yours. I borrowed $250 where I was painting a house and a lady who belonged to a Saturday night meeting, she co-signed for me and here I was president in my own company. I had a driving license and I had 11 passenger station wagons. <laughs> All in one year. I decided by this time I should find me a girlfriend. <laughs> but I had four teeth missing. In central, in, in, in Syracuse, New York, there is a bar room they call Smitty's. That's where all the New York Indians drink. I'm a Micmac Indian. I don't drink with New York Indians because we don't communicate too well. Every once in a while, about 20 of us Micmacs would get drunk and we go to Smitty's and we would communicate. <laughs> and that's where I lost my four teeth while I was communicating. I felt you couldn't find a decent girl with four teeth missing. Someone said to me one night, there is a new dentist in AA. And I was sober long enough to know that new people are very anxious to help you. <laughs> I found him one night. I said to him, I have a little problem. He says, what's the problem? I said, I'm looking for a girlfriend, but I have these four teeth missing. He gave me his card, and two months later, he gave me these teeth I have this morning. <laughs> then I met a lady in AA. She says to me, John, I'm told you have a car. I said, 11 passenger. <laughs> and she said, I, I run a home of an alcoholic women. I have nine girls, and I'm looking for someone to bring these girls to a meeting. Would you like the job? I said, I'll be very happy to. <laughs> That's where I met my wife, Kathy. On our way back from meeting that night, I said to her, how about a date? She said, no. <laughs> I mean, she didn't even think. But on my way home, I said to myself, I wouldn't the hell she'd think she is. She's living with those women, none of them have anything. Here I am, I'm president in my own company. <laughs> I got a new set of teeth. I drive 11 passenger station wagons. Who the hell wants her anyway? <laughs> And I guess when the, when the miracle happens, it happens the way it happens, because I think it happens to an individual. That's the way it is. It happens to an individual from where he is with what he has. You know, Thursday night, I picked the girls again. On our way back, I said to Kathy, would you like to go to movies in Boston? She said, yes. And on our way back, I asked her to marry me. She said, I don't even know you. I said, it's all right. We still have five miles to go. We'll get acquainted. <laughs> and three months later, we got married. We only had 80 miles, Kathy and I, and we didn't know where to go because she comes from a family where they don't like alcoholics. The family used to wear them round hats with a lot of feathers and nose way up in the air. <laughs> now I got two cars and 14 room houses. You can't get rid of bastards. Some of them don't. In closing, where I am grateful, no longer my past robbed me. No more. Of all the things about my past, no longer rob me. I don't have this feeling of emptiness that I have walked with for so many years in my life. I don't have this feeling of unworthiness that I have walked with for so many years in my life. And I don't have this feeling 
that I'm no good, that I have walked with so many years in my life. And you know, I don't know what life is all about. I know one thing. When you can travel all the way from Berlin, Mass, to Longview, Texas, to be able to stand up and every eyes you see this is a strange fate, but in your heart that you know and you feel that you belong. Something in this room is magic. And perhaps this is the way that God intended to be. For people from all walks of life to gather in one room and see each other as one people. Maybe that's what peace is. Certainly, these qualities are reserved for human beings. And I am very, very fortunate that I was given the opportunity to come to AA and met people who taught me to know myself, to believe in God, and to understand something about the nature of my sickness. Thank you very much.